Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar for the day. This is the COVID-19 uh, series. And the COVID-19 series is brought to you by the Kenya Medical Association, the Kenya Medical Practitioners and Dentist Union, the Na nursing, National Nursing Association of Kenya, Kenya Clinical Officers Association in partnership. Today, we are having a very interesting uh, discussion. As you know, over the last uh, four, three to four months, we've been uh, managing COVID-19 in Kenya and uh, some of the most hidden, but very, very important people are those who do what is called disease surveillance. Disease surveillance is trying to detect uh, where the disease is and they are also uh, charged with uh, doing what is called contact tracing. This is probably the most difficult job uh, during an epidemic. And today we are, we are pleased to have uh, Dr. Samuel Kadivane. Dr. Samuel Kadivane is a senior epidemiologist, senior medical epidemiologist at disease surveillance here in Nairobi. I'm pleased that um, during my first uh, trainings on COVID-19, he was one of my lecturers. So today I'll take him as a lecturer, plus uh, he's very vast with uh, disease surveillance. With him from Western Kenya is Paul Waliola. Paul Waliola is a, a clinical officer epidemiologist based in Vihiga County. He will be giving us the support discussion uh, about disease surveillance and will probably touch on how the experience is in Western Kenya. I'm also pleased to be reunited with uh, Soran Sora Diba, who we worked with in Isiolo County. Soran Sora Diba is, uh, uh, has experience in public health. He's an RN and is based in Isiolo County. In these webinars, we try to be as uh, inclusive as possible and touching all parts of this country. So without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Samuel Kadivane to make his presentation. And after that, we'll have comments from uh, Paul Waliola, then Soran Sora Diba. And after that, we will take your Q&A. At the bottom of your page, we have a chat and a Q&A. As the proceedings are going on, you could actually put in your Q questions at the chat and Q&A section, and we will answer them at the end of the presentations. Over to you, Dr. Kadivan. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Simon. Kigondo has been one of uh, my friends for quite some time from the campus days. Well. Uh, well, as you told, I'm uh, the, a medical epidemiologist working with the Division of Disease Surveillance and Epidemic Response. I also double up as the chairman for the Field Epidemiology Society of Kenya. Uh, my presentation will be in two parts. The first part is basic surveillance. Then the second part is going to be on uh, the COVID-19 indicators and what we are following up in uh, COVID-19. Okay. So... Uh, what is public health uh, surveillance? The definition from uh, WHO is this. It's an ongoing systematic collection, analysis, and interpretation of health-related data essential to the planning, implementation, evaluation, and public health practice, which is closely integrated with the timely dissemination of this data to those responsible for prevention and control. That is uh, the definition given by WHO, but I'm sure most of us, if you're working up at 4M and ask what is uh, surveillance, you cannot cover all this mouthful. So to make it easier for us and to ensure that we go to heaven, it has been simplified into information for action. So if anybody asks you what is surveillance, I'll give you 100% for saying it's information for action. But if we went through the WHO definition and I missed some things, definitely the marks will be gone. Okay. 
So what are some of the uses of uh, public health surveillance? Uh, first and foremost, you detect sudden changes in disease occurrence and uh, distribution. Uh, we also monitor trends and uh, patterns. We also portray the natural history of a uh, disease. We generate hypotheses and stimulate research, monitor changes in infectious agents, detect changes in health practices, evaluate control measures, like uh, what you're having now in uh, uh, COVID, we evaluate control measures by finding out how we are doing so far. Then it also facilitates uh, uh, planning. Uh, surveillance is list, uh, linked to action. And uh, what actions are taken? Number one is uh, outbreak investigation. We also do disease control through either vaccination or uh, prophylaxis and the elimination of a cause, then interruption of uh, transmission. Interruption of transmission can be in uh, many modes, one of which is treating the patients who, are, uh, who have actually been infected and removing them from other people through either quarantine or isolation. Uh, development targeting of uh, programs, say education, risk reduction, EDC, and uh, development of our policies and uh, regulations. They are mainly uh, developed from data that has been obtained through surveillance. What are the approaches uh, to surveillance? Number one, you could have what you call active versus passive. Active uh, surveillance is where the higher office calls the lower office to obtain information while passive surveillance is where the information flows in the traditional way from the lower levels to the higher levels. It could be categorical, that is you can just be following one disease or it could be integrated, which is what we currently use in Kenya, the integrated disease surveillance and response, IDSR. It could also be syndromic or laboratory based. Uh, syndromic means that it's a collection of uh, symptoms and signs as opposed to laboratory based, which is based on confirmation of the case through the laboratory tests. What is the IDSR strategy? In full, it is uh, uh, integrated disease surveillance and response, which was started in 1998 uh, by WHO. And uh, its main objectives was to strengthen capacity of, uh, for effective surveillance integrate disease surveillance with systems for efficiency, improve on the surveillance information for decision making, improve laboratory involvement in epidemic detection and confirmation, then increase involvement of clinicians in surveillance. It was also to improve surveillance information flow at all levels of the healthcare system and to emphasize community participation in surveillance, that is detection, and response. So what are the surveillance functions? The, four, the core functions of uh, surveillance include case detection, case registration and reporting, case confirmation, data analysis and interpretation, and of course, the response. The case detection is where you, you actually come to know is there a new disease or is there, are the numbers becoming higher than normal? So do you need to intervene? Then you do the registration of the cases and also have case confirmation. This confirmation is done through the laboratory where necessary. And further we do data analysis and interpretation. And of course, the response. Response could be in so many ways. It could be by treating. It could be by having quarantine imposed and all that. Uh, the supportive functions of surveillance include uh, communication. Once you have this data or this information, you need to communicate it to the other stakeholders. Number two is for training and uh, supervision, as well as uh, resource management and mobilization. Uh, it is crucial for us to do resource mobilization. And how do we do it? We do it by having proper data 
earn something that you can defend, depend on and defend easily. Uh, the surveillance indicators that are normally used include the timeliness, which is for the weekly reporting, the completeness, which is a proportion of the facilities uh, we report on a timely basis. Then it should be a complete report, weekly, monthly, and correctly filled and fully filled. Then there should be the surveillance uh, index, which is a weighted average of the timeliness, completeness, and complete reports. So surveillance is the backbone of disease control. It is a prerequisite for success of implementation. We have well-trained network of motivated staffs, clear guidelines and tools, uh, communication means, rapid response and feedback, and then sustainable funding, which is very, very important. So as regards uh, COVID-19 in Kenya, we recorded the first case of COVID-19, a confirmed COVID-19 case on the uh, 13th of March, which is about uh, going to six months now, since it was in March and now we are in uh, September. As at uh, yesterday, we had reported 34,493 cases with 20,449 recoveries, a recovery rate of 59.3%. However, you have also lost some uh, 581 patients. It brings us a case fatality rate, which is the number of deaths divided by the number of cases of 1.7. The worldwide uh, case fatality rate as of now is about 3.3%. Uh, we have so far done 448,128 tests with a positivity rate of 7.7% uh, and a test rate of 9,422 samples per 1 million people. All the 47 counties have uh, reported cases, and the majority of these cases as of now are from the community transmission. Initially, most of the cases were coming from outside the country, and they were imported from, the first case was imported through, uh, from uh, the US through uh, UK. So what response activities have we had? Number one is we have activated the Public Health Emergency Operations Center. We have so far had formation of rapid response teams at the national county and at the sub-county level as well. And also had contact tracing teams at all levels. We have enhanced uh, surveillance, mainly at the community, from the community level the facility level and also the points of uh, entry. We have also had enhanced laboratory testing capacity. Initially, we only had two functional labs, that is the National Influenza Center and Cambry at the national level. But currently we have 34 labs spread all over the country, regional, private labs, and there's also possibility of introduction of the serum test. This have proved to be a challenge, but where possible, this could be a good way of determining the prevalence of uh, the COVID-19, and uh, which is much cheaper and faster to carry out. We also had uh, mandatory quarantine and testing of everyone arriving from the outside of the country initially, though as of now, this has been uh, actually uh, minimized. You can uh, come in and uh, don't have to be on mandatory quarantine. There is mandatory wearing of uh, the mask at all public uh, places, as well as uh, social distancing. Contact tracing has been initiated at all levels, and uh, this is the key to actually containing a communicable uh, disease. 
for case management, we have uh, case management at the National Quarantine and Isolation Facilities, which are uh, Kenyatta uh, National Hospital, the Bagadi, the Bagadi Hospital, there is a Kenyatta University Hospital, as well as other private and uh, private institutions such as uh, Aga Khan, Mpisha, uh, Nairobi Hospital, and other non-governmental hospitals. We also have a training of uh, healthcare workers. These have been carried out throughout the country, and we have active contact tracing and uh, follow-up. We also have the national uh, nationwide curfew as from 9 p.m. to 4 a.m. on a daily basis. And initially, we actually had restricted movements in and out of the epicenters. The initial ones having been uh, Nairobi, Mombasa, Kilifi, Kwale, and uh, Madeira. This has uh, since been lifted. We also had closure of uh, the learning institutions. Uh, all schools, colleges, and universities are currently closed. And uh, our training is done on uh, basically on uh, the virtual platforms. There's closure of our bars and the eateries. Uh, stringent measures for reopening of the eateries, as well as uh, restricted international uh, flights. What are the daily surveillance indicators that uh, we look at? Number one, under epidemiology, we look at the confirmed cases and they are all line listed. The male to female ratio, which has been basically one to two, one male for two, uh, one, one female, for two males. We also look at the age distribution, the deaths, in the case fatality rates, and the attack rates, that is cases per 100,000 of uh, population. This is the epidemic curve so far, as uh, you might realize if you look at it, that uh, the first case was in week 11 of uh, this year, and the cases were quite few, and then started gaining momentum as from week 20, 20, week 20 they, we suddenly had a quick, actually, uh, rise, and we went all the way up for uh, a peak at week 31. This has uh, gradually come down, and as you realize, uh, week 36, we, have, uh, we had only one, a few cases, not as many as they were in week uh, 31. Uh, we also look at the number of labor laboratory tests that we have done, the absolute numbers of tests done, the number of positive cases, the positivity rates at the national and uh, the county level, and uh, we look at the positivity rate. This has been actually put on the, on the graph so that we can actually be able to see what is happening. Uh, our positivity rate was initially about 3%. Maybe that is because of the small sample size that we are having. Then it came down to 1%, rose to 3%, and gradually got to a peak in week uh, 30 to week 30. Then it has gradually been uh, uh, coming down. As of today, the positivity rate has been uh, going down at around 6%, but the average for the whole country is about 7.7% as of now. Uh, so we are not just looking at the number of cases, absolute number of cases going down, but even with that uh, sample collected, if it is 100, we are now seeing less becoming positive. The highest of the peak being 13%, 13 out of 100 were, of the samples collected were positive, but as of now, it has gone down to some level of even 6%. Uh, uh, 6%. So 
which are uh, the other indicators that we use. We use distribution of the cases by symptom presentation. About 93% of the cases have actually been asymptomatic. We also look at the presence of comorbidities and uh, an estimated rate of 30% of uh, the cases have comorbidities, particularly higher in the deaths, majority being uh, diabetics and uh, hypertension. We also do daily admissions and uh, discharges. We monitor them from each of the facilities. And uh, this is a daily, daily data has to be provided on this by the facilities as well as the sub-counties and counties. We also look at the admissions and discharges at the home-based isolation and care and uh, report on a daily basis on the deaths at the facilities of the home-based care as well as uh, community deaths suspected to be of COVID. Uh, under contact tracing, we also look at uh, the number of contacts that have been listed and uh, the number of cases with contacts listed, the number of cases without contacts listed, and the number of contacts on uh, follow-up. For healthcare workers, which is a crucial part of our as us being healthcare workers. Uh, we look at those who have been infected as well as uh, the deaths that have been reported so far. Uh, this data as it is now, approximately 694 health workers have been infected and we have had uh, uh, four deaths. These are the attack rates for the whole of Kenya. As uh, you might be able to to see the most affected with the highest attack rates is actually Nairobi. Then there is a bit in Busia and there is this uh, bit in, uh, I think, Ajiado. Mombasa had been having high rates and you can see from that, but uh, it has so since gone down. In fact, when you check even the positivity rate, right now, Mombasa is bringing a positivity rate of only about 1%, and uh, Nairobi is bringing even at around 3%. The other parts of the country are still reporting higher levels of positivity, and uh, that is because probably the, the level for the uh, epidemic in those areas is still, they have yet to peak. So what are the challenges? The challenges we've had are uh, challenges in communication from the county, counties especially for daily reporting. The laboratory capacity, we still have, we, see, we have uh, 34 laboratories, but as it is now, it's still not adequate for the whole of uh, the country. We also have had uh, frequent stockouts of uh, test kits and reagents, which is a global challenge, not just uh, tested in uh, Kenya. And uh, there are limited resources to carry out support supervision at all levels and uh, inadequate support to the county and sub-county uh, levels. I leave you with this. And it says, good surveillance does not necessarily ensure the making of the right decisions, but it reduces the chances of making the wrong ones. It was done by Alex Lamine in 1963. And the reason for collecting, analyzing, and disseminating information on a disease is to control that disease. Collection and analysis should not be allowed to consume resources if action does not follow. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kadivane. And uh, I think a lot of people are now aware of what the team at disease surveillance uh, are doing. Uh, I would want to continue the discussion and maybe get a view. I'll come back to you, Paul, uh, because Soran Sora had uh, indicated that he may be able to leave earlier. I want him to give us uh, a bit of some views from uh, Asal, arid and semi-arid area, 
of uh, Kenya because he's in Isiolo. Soran, Sora, are you available? Yeah, I'm available. Good, good afternoon. Yes, Soran, Sora, we are good. Good. Yeah, uh, my name is Soran, Sora, as you already introduced me with a background of uh, nursing and uh, public health. Uh, also seconded with uh, being an impact fellow, currently still ongoing, but to complete in December. Now, in Isiolo County, we have really done a good work as far as the COVID-19 approach is concerned, especially doing a lot of uh, what the national policy normally uh, entitled us to do. Like for example, as far as uh, our first case, which was actually a scene within our county in May, uh, May 7, our first index case, we really followed all the cases and the uh, contact tracing was really good. Though we had uh, uh, several challenges, you know, this is being a hard to reach area. You trace a uh, positive person being in Isiolo and then probably the contacts are within the peripheries, like a place like Garbatula, Gafarsa, Sericho, and many other places. So getting into these contacts is really, really very hard thing to, uh, to go through because it has many of its challenges. Basically, what we also really, as a, a county, this is to cut across all the counties, will be, for example, a entrenching of this uh, public health uh, of, uh, <coughs> emergency operation center to be cascaded down to all the 47 counties because for efficiency of uh, surveillance, the issues of uh, public health central part should be entrenched into all the 47 counties. So what is happening in Nairobi public health operation emergency center should be also happening within all the other 47 counties. So for our case so far, we had uh, in total around 56 positive cases but currently around uh, 14 care in home-based care and uh, one in our institutional, institutionalized management care. But all this, uh, we have really managed well, but there are so many other challenges in surveillance. And uh, one of the factors is that uh, this is one of the areas which is actually less budgeted. And uh, most of the resources merely are dependent on partners who are who normally support these affairs. So in future, we expect at least many of this country budget to go down to towards surveillance because surveillance is like the first gatekeeper in any disease where all, all the diseases are first of all, go to the information collected and the response group will carry forward as they disseminate to the community. So this surveillance should be actually given a, a huge budget. The other aspect of uh, challenges that we noted within this area is uh, delayed in reporting due to some network issues, especially the real-time reporting is really lacking because uh, some of these places are hard to reach. There are no networks, especially when we rely on this Safaricom and some places have no even boosters. Even road network is really a real issue. Issues of uh, capacity building for, of care, healthcare workers is also really vital because when we build the capacity of healthcare worker is when they will get information. An informed healthcare worker will be motivated and will do a lot of good progress in terms of assisting even these COVID-19 clients. Surveillance, remember, is not a rigid process. So it is currently moving from paperless as far as uh, reporting is concerned from paperless to a uh, computer based or something similar to uh, we need to give healthcare workers a lot of update on on technology especially the use of uh, softwares delayed preparedness is one of the also other challenges that we noted within this area because uh, people are not informed and uh, majorly the areas lack also basic infrastructure so we need actually to improve on all these systems. We have also issues of incompleteness of data within our, our setups. 
which we also need to improve. This could be also cross-cutting within all the other counties. And then also analyzing our epidemiological patterns and curve. How are we doing? Are we doing also research? If, for example, this disease is with us, are we doing other research in order to know that? Is it exactly COVID or other diseases are the ones which are emanating within these counties? So continuous research and having research department, areas where we have knowledge management in these 47 counties is really very, very important and very vital. Workload is one area which also has a, an issue in terms of uh, challenges. Uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of addition of data, especially those people are responsible at the service delivery point. Example like nurses who are really doing a lot of good work within the health facilities, doctors, and many other health workers who are really laboring a lot in giving a, a good service to the community. So basically those are the challenges we have really noted, but uh, since probably we are noting that the curve is also do, that going down, we are still adding uh, our core healthcare workers still to pull up our socks and then continue doing the best for our community so that uh, these services, this COVID will be put at bay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sora and Sora. And uh, a lot of the issues uh, that you have brought out, uh, I can relate to having been uh, in Isiolo for five years, sometime earlier on. And uh, those are the challenges that disease surveillance uh, is supposed to record. And uh, maybe we will discuss later, but I think the, the reason uh, public health and disease surveillance was one of the reasons for uh, devolved governance. So devolved governance is actually supposed to invest a lot in uh, public health because uh, they are the ones who actually are closest to the people. Let me move on to Western Kenya, where Paul uh, comes from in Vihiga, and he may give us his experience and tell us whether the border crossing points are a risk factor who, to his county or what his experience is. Paul Waliaula. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, I'm Paul from Vega County. Yeah, uh, we are battling with COVID-19 virus. And currently, as we are all aware, we are in the stage of uh, case finding. Little has already been known about the virus, but much is being done worldwide, at least to understand it better, and maybe to come up with a concentrated way of managing it. So in Vega County, we are doing case finding, and in that case, we are doing contact tracing for those people who have been tested positive, uh, as well as uh, case detection at facility level. Most facilities are now doing screening at the gate. So anybody going in, into the facility is being screened for respiratory tract infection. And probably if you have uh, those symptoms, uh, there is a way you will be shown and further tests will be done. Uh, clinicians will do a uh, follow-up history and uh, recommendations will be done. Uh, we are also doing disease uh, prevention and con. especially in health facility, PPE is shortage, but at least uh, healthcare workers are putting on uh, face masks. And this is actually a very good strategy. If we have universal uh, use of face masks, at least this virus may be contained. 
IPC at the facility, administrative control, uh, especially screening and uh, triage. But now, uh, when we talk about surveillance in general, is actually key. And all, all healthcare workers should participate in uh, disease surveillance. It is a hidden treasure. Planning should be best in this in uh, in surveillance, because if planning is not best in surveillance, we may not uh, do anything good for our country and our counties. But now the problem is how is the data flowing from grassroots to up there? We have several challenges. Uh, what is the role of, for example, clinicians? In, in disease surveillance. Do they understand their role? We also have challenges in uh, terms of communication, information flow. Uh, lab capacity is also a challenge in big county and also limited resources. And most importantly, I would like to say that we have a RRT team at the county and the county level, which is helping, uh, which is actually like the one in, 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 in at the county level is supervisor, is doing supervisor work, while the one at the sub county levels are implementing uh, these activities. Thank you for now. Thank you very much, Paul, for your experience in uh, Vihiga County. And uh, a lot of the challenges that you are facing in disease surveillance are being faced uh, by persons uh, across all counties. And uh, uh, I now want to open up to some of the questions that uh, have been asked in the chat. And... Uh, uh, Jebet Boit, uh, my friend Jebet Boit is asking, what is the laboratory testing strategy and disease management plan for key populations, especially in uh, the field of people who inject drugs and who have to take methadone daily? I suppose she might be in the methadone clinic. Um, Dr. Kadivane? Yeah. Yes. Um, I might not be able to answer it completely, but uh, what I can say is that uh, we actually have a testing strategy that was uh, prepared by the ministry. And uh, I think it should be, it should be out, eh? specifically for the uh, drug injectors and, uh, and such. I don't think it was specifically aimed for them, but there's uh, the methadone program that is done by NASCOP, which can actually be incorporated and uh, these uh, particular groups uh, looked in uh, for that. Th thank you very much, uh, Kadivane, for that. Um, Adan Doshe is asking, now that COVID-19 is in the community, how can proper contact tracing done to ensure all primary contact are in quarantine and tested. Soran, Soran, before you leave, I think you can take that one because I suppose it's more difficult to do uh, contact tracing and uh, quarantine in uh, <laughs> the ASAL areas. Uh, yeah, thanks for a good question from Adan Doche. Uh, Contact tracing is really very vital in management of uh, COVID-19 cases. However, approach through uh, continuous empowering and capacity building of community volunteers, community leaders, especially the gatekeepers, religious leaders, and probably women groups within this zone has really assisted us through some funding from some partners and as well as the county government. So for our case, like Isiolo County, we have managed very well to to, to have trained uh, around 700, close to 700 uh, community volunteers 
who are now currently moving from one house to, her, to the other house to do contact tracing and then give us the information as a surveillance team within the county. Could be those are among the, the lessons they can learn from our, our county. The other aspect is the, probably the use of uh, radios, radio stations which are based within the counties. Like for example, uh, they have also radio called Ipse in Marsabit. Adan Dochev is based in Marsabit, I know most, most probably. So they can use awareness within the radios, awareness among the peers, so that uh, the issues of contact tracing is done efficiently. And then we can also do what we call the people should not stigmatize people who are suffering, those people who have suffered COVID-19 because it is just a disease like any other disease. So there is no way we need to have, we, we can stigmatize people. Unless we destigmatize, this disease will have some devastating effect on our people. So as healthcare workers, as also frontline managers of this disease, we need to bring these key messages home so that people can adhere to it and then teach also our community volunteers as well as our religious leaders, as well as those people at home to adhere to COVID-19 rules, which are set by the uh, policy guidelines as far as the Kenyan government is concerned. Thank you. Okay. Let me just add on to that. Huh? Um, when, uh, chair. Um, contact tracing is actually the backbone of uh, uh, stopping a communicable disease from uh, continuously becoming uh, uh, a burden. Well, if you get all the contacts to a case and you actually quarantine them, then there shall be no one to spread the disease outside there. So the counties that have uh, fewer cases, it's still early and you can be able to do proper contact tracing and quarantine. This is the backbone to preventing the spread of uh, COVID-19. Other counties like uh, Nairobi and uh, Mombasa, the cases have become, have become so much, though right now they're coming down, that uh, it, becomes a, it becomes a bit of a problem to do, say, contact tracing if you have a, a burden of 539 cases in one day. But as of now, the cases have come down. Okay. So contact tracing is the backbone of all this. Thank you. Uh, Ruta, thank thank you very much, Paul. Can you give us a Western perspective? Okay. Uh, so thank you so much. Uh, contact tracing is actually key in uh, management of any communicable disease, including COVID-19. And the main challenge with COVID-19 is that uh, most of the cases are asymptomatic. Like in Kenya, Dr. said, 93% uh, of cases are asymptomatic. That is that poses a very serious challenge in uh, cutting the spread of disease because these cases are actually out there. They are spreading disease uh, while and they are asymptomatic. Therefore, they are not in the, in the house. They are out there. So it is actually a serious challenge in uh, trying to do contact tracing. And to add on something also, uh, Senzora talked about stigma, and stigma is actually a challenge also in management of, uh, in controlling the spread of uh, COVID-19. And stigma usually comes uh, because of two things, wrong information and fear. Maybe to overcome stigma, it is uh, the highest time we give the population right urgently, uh, at least right information, so that they overcome their fear. This uh, happened uh, way back when we, we were dealing with HIV in initial stages, where uh, there was a lot of stigma. But when uh, information was uh, passed to the community, at least they have now understood it, and stigma is going down. Uh, same can be applied to the COVID-19 disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, <clears throat> from uh, 
from the Q and A again, we have um, uh, Adam Doshe has answered. I think we have actually covered. Yes, there was an interesting question as to why the, the rationale behind the curfew. Uh, Kadivane, you must have uh, advised the government for the curfew. So, <laughs> what is the rationale behind the curfew? That is. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Kigondo. Um, the curfew basically is to restrict, uh, was basically to restrict movement. Eh? And you realize when uh, we had the 7 to 5 a.m., it was quite effective in restricting movement and ensuring that uh, people don't uh, spend their time out there and become a risk to spreading this. You realize even the alcohol, the, the ban on alcohol had helped because uh, when you take alcohol, that's when you become... Uh, more and easily uh, vulnerable to getting the, the disease. But the main thing about the curfew is the restriction of movement and interaction of uh, people. Okay. Yes, th thank you very much. Uh, as Soran Soran, does that apply to Isiolo? Yes, the curfew is, the curfew rule is applied. Yes, the curfew actually rule is applied and the, our people are really following it strictly and stringently. Thank you. So this is a question direct to the National uh, Disease Surveillance Team. Is COVID-19 curve slowing down or is it that testing is not ongoing? I think, uh, Kadivane, you had covered it in your slides, but maybe you could repeat for Galgalo, Golicha. Oh, okay. Yeah, this has been a major, a major concern for many people. And uh, from what we picked, and I, I showed you earlier in the slides, that uh, there are two things that we are using to measure that. Number one is the absolute numbers. The absolute numbers have gone down uh, given that the two major contributors, Nairobi and uh, Mombasa, things are uh, becoming better and better by the day. So the numbers, absolute numbers are coming down. Number two, we looked at the positivity rate. Positivity rate is also coming down, meaning that in the past, if you could do 100 tests, from those 100, 13 would be possible, positive. There's a time that even went all the way up to some of the counties, up to 25%. So when this comes down, it is now irrespective of the number of, uh, the number of tests you have done, but now it is the rate for each of the tests that you have done. So if you realize from the, gra from the graphs I showed you, the number of cases are going down as well as the positivity rate. In Nairobi right now, it may be around, it was uh, last, uh, the last time I checked, it was uh, th around 3.3%. 3, 3 Mombasa had about 1.1%. 1, 1 but other areas like, uh, I think, uh, Kericho, uh, Kiambu are still, still a, bit high, a bit higher. So that is why you're, you're turning this with the caution, because the other counties might not have gotten to their peak, and they might be, they might be now still uh, seeing more, more cases. But the thing is, both positivity and positivity, the absolute numbers and the positivity rates are going down. So that gives us more confidence. And uh, we we'll talk about triangulation, getting information from one side to another. So when we do triangulation, that could actually be an indicator that the cases uh, are, com are coming down and we are flattening the curve. Yeah, so James Omoeri on following up on the same question is asking why we are seeing a drop in COVID-19 cases in the country and he's asking whether that does that mean that the curve is flat? I think I've addressed that the curve might be flattening, but it's good to be cautious just for the other for the other counties. Nairobi, Mombasa, we might have uh, gone past the peak, but for the other counties, probably not yet. So you just are uh, waiting to see how it goes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, Soran Sora, is the curve flattening in Isiolo? And Paul, is the curve flattening in Vihiga?
Yeah, so far for our end, we are already we are only getting one one cases, unlike some some days where we normally have six seven. So chances are that the, the curves are really flattening. Thank you. Yeah, in the Hague, uh, we cannot actually say whether the curve is flattening because. Uh, actually, this, as uh, Dr. Kadivan said, this is a county that has not recorded the uh, highest number of cases in a single day. But now, we are still in initial phase. phase. However, uh, preventive measures are already there. They are put in place and they are being implemented. So, uh, if it goes on like that, we may uh, actually achieve a, a prevention. Yeah. Beatrice Jelagat is asking, uh, how accurate are our testing kits? That may be beyond the realm of disease surveillance. Uh, and I think there was a, a testing, uh, one of the webinars was on testing. Uh, I'm not seeing any more questions uh, unless some have just come in. Has any rapid, Ambani Ronald is asking whether any rapid antigen test have been validated for local use. Dr. Kadivani, I saw that you said that we are moving to antibody tests just to see the prevalence. Have any rapid antigen tests been validated in your... Oh, as of now in Kenya, I don't, I'm, I'm not aware of any rapid test kit that has been validated and uh, uh, given a go ahead to go into the market. But it's, a, it's, it's, it's an area that needs, we need actually to have that so that we can actually do uh, the prevalence. Eh? Because if you do the rapid uh, test, it tells you that you, you have at one time encountered COVID. And if you can do that random, then you can be able to tell the, pre, the prevalence of these in terms of uh, going ahead and saying that we have achieved maybe herd immunity or uh, which kind of uh, positivity do we have. Some of them done in, uh, say, Germany, they were reporting a, a rate of 10%. So here we are yet to get those uh, validated uh, rapid test kits. Uh, my friend, uh, Dr. Manasseh Ndakalu, is, you are still in Madusabit. Uh, salamu, Salamu. He's asking, are we sure the curve is flattening when we know that the numbers tested has reduced due to inadequate testing kits? And that also follows up. Kadivani, I think you'll take this, uh, as to why are we not testing large samples? Is it because there are not enough samples being taken because a few people are reporting symptoms or is it because there are no reagents? That's a question by Dominic Abungo. Uh, maybe you could take both as we come to the tail end of our presentation. Yes, uh, Kigondo, I think I've addressed that uh, severally, the issue of uh, the positivity and the absolute numbers. So we have more confidence in the positivity rate as opposed to the absolute numbers. Because even if you tested uh, 100 or you tested 3,000, the positivity rate will tell you this is coming, becoming lower and lower. So the absolute numbers, we might not be doing as uh, much as we, we did in the past in terms of the testing, but as we are using both the positivity rate and the absolute uh, numbers. Um, what was the other question? The other question is, why are we not testing large samples? Is it oh, large samples. Mm -hmm. There's a time we did the mass, uh, mass testing, but it had a lot of uh, challenges. As of now, we have not been doing much of uh, uh, mass, mass testing. Uh, whether it is because of the lack of the test kits, that one I cannot answer. I don't know. Yeah, thank you very much. I see that has been, and uh, there is probably Ndegwa uh, Mwanyoha is asking whether the Russian vaccine has arrived. Paul, are you aware of the Russian vaccine? 
Thank you, Doctor. I'm uh, I'm actually not aware of the Russian vaccine arriving in Kenya, but what I know is that uh, worldwide efforts are being made, at least to come up with a safe uh, vaccine that can be applied to the population, so that this epidemic can come to end. However, as far as Kenya is concerned, I'm yet to know whether it has a right. A very important question, I think, Kadivani, Walter Wajenje is asking whether we are likely to see an upsurge in cases if we ease the measures and where is re reinfection possible or will we develop immunity? Uh, I think that's a straight surveillance question. Oh, yes. Now, um, number one, one is that uh, the issue about uh, resurgence of cases, uh, what I can say is that uh, some of the countries that have eased the uh, measures have had resurgence of, uh, of cases. So we are yet to, to see what happens. But uh, most of uh, the African continent has not been behaving in the same way that it, uh, the European countries have been behaving. So I really cannot answer that and say for sure we shall see resurgence of cases. But it's good to just take the precautions. The other question about uh, the infection, there has been uh, one article from uh, South Korea uh, claiming uh, actually a, re a reinfection of one of the cases. Um, permanent uh, immunity, they, that might be, might be given the class or the family in which these uh, viruses come from, the same class with the influenzas, I don't know whether you can be able to get permanent, uh, permanent uh, vaccination or immunity status. So given the class, most likely no. Thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, and uh, Paul, can, do you have a st uh, comment on that? Yes, I have a comment uh, about uh, the impact of easing uh, measures that are already there. Uh, indeed, based on generally infectious diseases, uh, if uh, preventive measures have been identified and they're put in place, there is usually a tendency of uh, the epidemic curve going down. However, when these uh, preventive measures are eased, there is likelihood that uh, there could be another wave or resurgence of, uh, of, of, of the, the infection. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, uh, uh, Dr. Adede is asking whether of late there is a push to open schools. Are there clear cut strategies on controlling and managing COVID-19 in institutions, and I think if we listen to Dr. Mag uh, Professor Magoha the other day, I think uh, there it's are 15 various hours. stakeholders who are uh, actually looking at how to open uh, schools using the various strategies. So I think that's a discussion for another day. And as we come to the tail end of our presentation, I would like to welcome uh, Jemima Kibira. Jemima Kibira is the project uh, officer at the National Nurses Association of Kenya. As you know, this uh, COVID webinar series is, uh, they are brought to you by the associations KMPDU, NANAC, and KCOA. And uh, Jemima Kibra now will uh, give us some of the issues that have gone on in the past, and uh, she will close off the meeting by thanking our presenters. Jemima. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Kigondo. Uh, mine will be very brief, just to thank all the attendees and the panelists for that very informative session. And uh, just to bring to everyone else uh, our every Thursday COVID-19 case management webinars and, uh, and every Tuesday mental health uh, webinars that we conduct every other week, every week rather. 
for CPDs, we will do as usual. We will send through the registration emails that uh, we sent our, we registered for this webinar so that we can have our CPD records done. Um, next week on Thursday, we will have critical care management and oxygen therapy for COVID-19 patients. So stay tuned for that. Otherwise, from me, thank you very much and um, have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. And thank you very much. And we want to thank Kadivane, Soran Sora and Waliula. And uh, we hope to see you more often. And thank you for the work you're doing for COVID-19 for this country. And people should realize that as the curve goes down, it is not that the money disappeared. It is because people are working to ensure that it goes down. <laughs> we should also not forget that. Thank you very much, team. And with that, I think we end the session. Asante Nisana.